you. Thanks. Um, I have been looking forward to this for a couple of years now. Um, no exaggeration. My schedule has been quite busy, but uh, Chaplain Phillips and I started these discussions about two years ago. And to be honest with you, I am a huge fan of this institution. Because I am an avid reader, um, a lover of history, this institution, the leaders that this institution has created and what they have done for our country over more than 100 years, has, this institution has always meant a great deal to me. So this is my first chance ever to get to VMI and I am so glad to be with y'all tonight. Um, as you just heard, I have a lot of combat experience. So if you don't mind, I'll just tell some more stories tonight. How does that sound? Does that sound all right? Um, many of you saw the clip that was scrolling for just a few moments before this uh, evening began from the movie Black Hawk Down. Just if you don't mind, humor me for a second. Show of hands, how many of you in this room have not seen the movie Black Hawk Down? Okay, I heard that it just uh, was released on Netflix, so if you want to watch it for free, you can go watch it on Netflix. But I will tell you a quick story that kind of picks up where this little clip left off from the movie Black Hawk Down. I'm in Mogadishu, Somalia in the summer of 1993. As you've heard just a moment ago, I'm one of those guys that has been in the Ranger Regiment basically from the time that I enlisted in the Army. My first assignment is the Ranger Regiment and I was assigned to the Ranger Regiment as a private, was sent to the invasion of Panama as a young sergeant in 1991. I'm a staff sergeant in, in Desert Storm in, uh, in 89. I'm a sergeant in Panama in 91. I'm a staff sergeant in Desert Storm. So by the time that I get to Somalia, I have uh, more combat experience than most of the guys in the Ranger Regiment. And Somalia for us was, uh, by the way, our unit was training at the time in Texas. We were doing this joint readiness exercise and we got a phone call to stop what we were doing, get on airplanes, fly to the East Coast and start to prepare for a mission that we didn't know uh, what, it would, what it would foretell. Uh, at the national command level, there was a lot of discussions about whether or not Task Force Ranger would actually be sent to Somalia. Here's a quick uh, bit of trivia for you. Uh, there was an argument between the United States Special Operations Command and the President of the United States about whether or not Task Force Ranger would go to Somalia. And the argument uh, basically just ended with, all right, we're not going to send them. Send everybody back to Texas and start training again like nothing happened. I landed on back in Texas, picked up where we left off, was doing some training, and about uh, 12 hours later got notified, get back on airplanes, fly back to the East Coast. No, you were really going this time. Now for most of the guys, that got kind of uh, frustrating for them, though for me, this was old hand because I got notified probably a dozen times that the U.S. was going to invade Panama before we actually invaded. More than a few times, I packed my bags and was on airplanes getting ready to invade Panama before we decided not to invade Panama. And the reason why I knew the last one was for real is because I was supposed to be going on leave that day. My commanders were supposed to be going on leave that day when they basically tore up the leave forms and said, nobody's going anywhere. You're not going home. You're going to Panama. So for me, it was old hat to get um, uh, what we would say, get all spun up just to take all of your kit off and to go sit back down and go back to training. When we arrived in Panama, the night that the airplanes landed and we occupied this little base at the airfield, Task Force Ranger was a really, really small unit of about 400 of us, helicopter uh, uh, unit and their supporters, special operations forces and their supporters, and about 112, 120 Army Rangers all in this large hangar in Mogadishu, Somalia. And I realized the first night, in fact, I said to my men, I'm a squad leader in Mogadishu, Somalia, and I said to my men the first night, this one is gonna be different than Panama and then Desert Storm. Because when I was in Panama, the Panamanian Defense Forces were locking themselves in their own handcuffs and turning themselves in because they wanted nothing to do with fighting against the United States military. If you were around in 91, even if you weren't in uh, Kuwait or in Iraq, you saw the pictures of 
tens of thousands of Iraqi military surrendering in mass to the US military because by the time that we rolled across the berm and actually started to occupy Kuwait and Iraq those Iraqi forces realized that they were grossly outnumbered and had no chance of success the night that we arrived in Somalia we landed at probably five six o'clock in the afternoon and at nine o'clock at night we started to get mortared and attacked at this airfield and almost nightly got mortared and attacked. I said to my men on the very first night, this enemy is different. This enemy is willing to fight and this enemy is willing to die, unlike the Panamanians, unlike the Kuwaitis, or I mean, unlike the Iraqis. And I didn't realize just how willing to fight they were. So if you understand the, from the book Black Hawk Down, the movie doesn't really portray this, this much of the operation, but Task Force Ranger conducted seven missions in Somalia. The last mission is the mission that makes it to the book in the movie Black Hawk Down. As you just heard, we were sent over there as a special operations task force to take down a clan that was really creating all of the instability and ultimately to remove the clan leader, Muhammad Farah ID. So Task Force Ranger is starting to be effective. We're starting to take down some pretty important people in the clan. And each of the missions that we're doing is a little bit more difficult. Those missions are starting to become a little bit more dangerous. And I'm telling you this because I think you ought to understand the logic behind the decision to launch the task force on October 3rd, 1993. Because this is a daylight raid into the very center of the town that is controlled by Muhammad Farah ID. These seven warlords that controlled the town each had kind of pockets where this is their part of town, you don't go in my part of town unless we let you in my part of town. And we were about to go kick in the front door of Muhammad Farah ID's part of town in the middle of the daylight, which is incredibly unusual for special operations forces at this time. Reason why, there's several factors that caused us to make this decision, and ultimately it was the task force commander, Major General William Garrison's decision to launch Task Force Ranger on a daring daylight raid into the very heart of town where Ideed and his task force was. A Couple of things were at play. One, we had been in the country now for about three months on what we thought was really gonna be about a six or an eight week operation and it was going much slower than we thought it was going to be. But really the part that the book doesn't depict, the movie really doesn't show you, is how much pressure we were getting from the Clinton administration and from the White House to wrap this thing up. We were getting immense pressure. Get this thing over with and get out of Somalia because the news is starting to equate Somalia with Vietnam and it's costing the administration in um, public opinion points. So we get a tip on Sunday afternoon that two really high-ranking leaders are meeting in the same building at the same time in the very center of the ID part of town. And we knew this was a really, really dangerous uh, scenario. We also knew that if we get in there, there's a very small contingency force of the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division that may be able to provide a quick reaction force, but once you're in there, you have no reserves. This is it. There's no backup. You're in there, and it's up to you to get yourself out. So Task Force Ranger launches a mission to go get these two guys uh, special operators fly in on Little Bird helicopters, very much like you see in the movie Black Hawk Down. Rangers fly in on Black Hawks and uh, slide down ropes and provide blocking positions at the four corners of the target building. Not going to talk you through the whole tactical operation. But I will say, when those Rangers are sliding down the fast ropes from the Black Hawk helicopters, and we don't really know what happened to this day, one of those Rangers, Todd Blackburn, Missed the, the black or missed the fast rope and he fell about 70 feet and he landed in the city streets head first. So my company commander started to call me on the radio, got the message back to the battalion commander who was right there with me and said, Hey, Todd Blackburn is seriously wounded. He may not even make it out of the city streets. We need to get him immediate medical attention. I took my Humvees up to get to Blackburn, who was already unconscious, bleeding from his nose and his mouth, and I uh, placed him on a stretcher. 
with a couple of our medics working on him just trying to keep Blackburn alive. And my commander made the decision to send me and my squad, 10 men on two Humvees, to escort Blackburn out of the target building, get him immediate medical attention. Now we were getting shot at on this target building, unlike the other uh, objectives that we've done in Somalia, almost the moment that we arrived. But to be frank with you, most of the small arms fire wasn't really effective. Uh, on any of the targets that we did. In fact, it was pretty ineffective. And the bullets were going over my head, but they were going well over my head. I really wasn't that worried about the small arms fire. I was more concerned about Blackburn's head and neck injuries and how poor those road conditions were in Mogadishu. See, the Somali uh, clans had been hiding roadside bombs in the middle of the road in potholes covering them up with some debris and as soon as we drove down the roads they'd set those those roadside bombs off underneath our vehicles um, in order to try to blow those vehicles up because the roads didn't exist basically just dirt with with holes in them so i in, i instructed the guy who was driving my humvee i, I split my men up into two two uh vehicles put uh, myself and half of my squad on the the lead vehicle put the rest of my guys on the trail vehicle and had todd blackburn in a cargo humvee in the middle three vehicles leaving the target building after being there for only about 10 minutes and i instructed the guy who was driving my humvee to drive really slowly and to avoid as many bumps and potholes as possible we're driving about 10 or 15 miles an hour. We drive by uh, the Target building and we make a right turn onto Hawadig Road. And this is the scene that you see from Black Hawk Down. When we turn this corner on this really narrow road, 10, 15 meters wide, this three vehicle convoy started to get engaged from about 200 different directions at the same time. Now, when I say this, I'm talking about RPGs from 20 feet away and hand grenades from rooftops and small arms fire on automatic from point blank range on these three Humvees as we're driving down the road. And one of the Somali gunmen is on the right side of the road, down the road, hiding, waiting for us. We're getting hit from every direction. We've got a guy who's 18 years old, who's never been in, who hasn't been in the army for a year, who's operating a 50 caliber machine gun on top of my Humvee, spraying bullets everywhere, trying to return fire in 360 directions at once. Because he wasn't being very effective that way, I told him, um, Brad Paulson, to take his 50 cal, point it to the left side of the hum vehicle, Humvee, and pick up all of the Somali gunmen on the left side of the Humvee. There was another machine gunner sitting in the back of my Humvee named Dominic Pilla, and I told Pilla to take his machine gun, face it to the right side of the vehicle, pick up all of the Somali gunmen on the right side. I'll take care of everybody in the front. Tim Moynihan, another guy in my Humvee, will take care of everybody behind us, and now we're just trying to keep each other alive long enough to make it back to the base. Now, the movie deliberately downplays some of the violence. I guess you should know this. The movie was very close to an X rating for violence when it was released as it is. So it doesn't depict just how violent this scene really was. But as we're driving down the road, we're getting hit from point blank range from 200 directions at the same time. And we're trying to engage fire and trying to keep each other alive. And we're driving at maybe 20, 25 miles an hour. And one of these Somali gunmen that's down on the right side of the road sees Dominic Pilla sitting right behind me at the same time that Pilla sees him. Now these two guys turn their weapons to each other at the same moment and they shoot and kill each other at the exact same instant. Unlike the movie, Dominic Pilla was shot in the forehead just above his ballistics helmet. He took a massive head wound and he was killed instantly. And he fell over into the lap of Specialist Tim Moynihan. And then Moynihan began to panic and started to scream my name out. Sergeant Strucker, Pill has been hit, he's been killed. And when I looked over the back of my shoulder, it was like the back of that whole Humvee had just been painted red with Dominic Pilla's blood. And now as a combat leader, I want you to hear something because I'm not ashamed to admit at this moment, I started to get terrified for my own life started to think about my men and think, uh-oh, we're all going to die in the next few seconds. The math says that we're not going to make it out of the city streets alive. 
And then the very next thing that started to cross over my mind is, Jeff, you're a leader of this small patrol. You better get yourself under control if you're going to be able to get your men under control. And so as calmly as I was able to, I told Tim Moynihan to take his weapon, turn to the right side of the Humvee, pick up Dominic Pillow's sector of fire, and kill as many bad guys as possible if we're going to have any chance of survival. We go through a number of other obstacles. I don't even want to talk about all of them tonight because um, it'll take too long. But when we finally made it back to the base, the scene back there is total chaos. And I mean, people are rushing everywhere. We're spinning up helicopters. We're trying to get more Humvees ready to go back out into the city streets. I pulled back in, letting the task force um, operations know that I've got a guy who's killed in action and another guy who's very seriously wounded in action on these vehicles that are now shot to pieces. And there's a guy who's basically a, um, he's totally calm while everybody else is freaking out around us as soon as we pulled back in that day. In fact, he's almost waiting for me as soon as I pull back into the airfield and I'm looking for him in this room because I hope that I was gonna be able to see him tonight. Is Dr. Marsh here tonight? Is he here? Hey, would you stand up for just a second? Because that man right there is solely responsible for Todd Blackburn still being alive tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Rob Marsh. I was amazed by his self-control, and frankly, it was your self-control that, that caused me to, to start to get things under control a little bit when I saw you as soon as we arrived that night. And he didn't save just Todd Blackburn. There are several other men from Task Force Ranger that are still alive tonight because of him. Thank you, Dr. Marsh, for what you did for us over there. So um, as soon as we arrive back at the base, I wanna, I wanna talk to you about courageous leadership from the perspective of the, one of the men that's on the back of my Humvees. His name is Brad Thomas. Because as soon as we get back to the base, you see this scene in the movie Black Hawk Down. My Humvees completely shot to pieces, were basically low on ammunition, and my platoon leader, Lieutenant Larry Moores, walked up to me and he said, Jeff, a second Black Hawk helicopter just got shot down. Now, I didn't know the first Black Hawk went down because I was still busy just trying to get out of the city streets and get Blackburn back to the base. And he said, we've already put the search and rescue force in at uh, the Cliff Wolcott crash site. Mike Durant's helicopter just crashed in the city. We don't have anybody else who can go back out there. I need you to get your men on your Humvees and get them ready to go back out into the city streets. One of the special operators who was riding back with me overheard this conversation and he kind of stepped off to the side with me and he's like, hey, Sergeant, if you're really going to go back onto the city streets tonight, don't leave your men sitting in the back of your Humvee in all of that blood. He said that will have serious psychological effects on him. What you probably need to do is to go clean this Humvee up before you go back out of those city streets. Now we didn't have running water. So I sent all of the rest of my guys, go get some more fuel, get some more ammunition, get the vehicles ready to go back out in the streets. And I pulled this one Humvee off to the side with buckets and brushes, started to clean the back of my Humvee up and get it ready to go back out in those city streets. And I will tell you without any hesitation, this was the most terrifying moment of my life. Because everything inside of me was saying, Jeff, if you go back out there, you will die tonight. And as a leader, if you drive your men back through this, Dominic Pilla is the first guy killed in action in the task force at this point. You've just got one guy killed. If you drive the rest of your men back through what you just went through, every one of them will die tonight. And I was thinking to myself, this is no exaggeration. This is a suicide mission. If we're going to go back out in those city streets, all of us are going to die. And I'm trying to figure out how do, I, how do I get myself under control and I'm trying to figure out how do I get myself ready to go back out into those city streets and, and I'm cleaning this blood up off of the back of this Humvee, getting ready to go back out into the city streets and one of the officers from our unit, Major Craig Nixon, grabs me and he tells me something that I, I wasn't aware of. He said, Jeff, have you ever been on a hot LZ? I said, well, yeah, in Panama. He's like, no, have you ever gone into the exact same hot LZ that you just came out of? And I said, no. He said, I have. And it's no fun. And let me tell you, it's hard to lead men, lead men into a firefight. 
it's exceptionally hard to lead them back into the firefight that you just came out of. And this is exactly what we're asking you to do, Jeff. Get your men ready to go out into those city streets with you. I don't know if he could read minds, but one of the guys from my unit, Brad Thomas, and this is the guy that I want you to put yourself in his shoes for just a second. When we get ready to go back out in the city streets, we're not exactly sure where Mike Durant's helicopter crashed. In fact, the best that I could get from my boss is, hey, it's somewhere in here. We don't even have a map, we have a satellite photo. It's somewhere in here, but don't worry about it because there's helicopters in the sky. They'll tell you where to turn. They'll take you right to the crash site, Jeff. I'm getting my guys ready to get on the Humvees and go back out in the city streets. And one of my men, Specialist Brad Thomas, walked up to me. And he said, hey, Sergeant, I can't go back out there with you tonight. I've got a wife at home, and I know I'm going to die if I go back out there. And so I basically just need to sit this one out. Now, I just want you to understand something. If you're not familiar with the Ranger Regiment and the kind of combat warriors that the Ranger Regiment creates, it is unheard of that a Ranger would look another Ranger in the eyes and say, I can't do this. But he was thinking exactly what I was feeling in my own heart and probably what everybody else was feeling like. This is a suicide mission. We're all going to die. He was the only guy that was willing to just say it out loud. So at this moment now, I'm in a bit of a ethical conundrum or a leadership challenge, as I like to put it. Because I have all of the authority with my position and by my rank to order this man to get back on the Humvees and to drive back out in those city streets. But I knew ordering him to do it may be counterproductive. So before I explain to you how this situation went any farther, I just want to ask you for a second. You put yourself in Brad Thomas's shoes right now. Got a brand new wife at home, relatively new to the Army, just got a chance to see one of your best friends get his head almost blown all the way off in Somalia, and you know without a shadow of a doubt this is going to happen to you if you go back out of those Humvees. Let me ask you for just a second, those of you who are about to become combat leaders, those you cadets in this room, what moves a man to get back on those Humvees? Is it raw power, I'm your boss, you're going to do what I tell you to do whether you want to do it or not? Is that going to move a guy to get on those Humvees and to give his life if necessary? And now I'm going to do a little audience interaction for just a second because I tell this part of the talk at corporations, college campuses, civic events all over America. Because I don't think most people understand the, the levers that really move a man when he knows deep in his heart, if I go do what you're asking me to do, I'm going to die. So you tell me, what is it that would motivate a guy to get back on a Humvee and to drive back out there? What is it? You just said your buddies. The answer to the question, let me tell you what the answer is not. It's not the flag. Now, Brad Thomas is a patriot. He loves our country. He enlisted and chose the most difficult assignment in the Army to serve as a private in the Ranger Regiment. You wouldn't do that if you weren't a patriot and you didn't love your country. But patriotism doesn't cause you to go willingly to your death. Let me tell you what also doesn't do it. It's not the awards and the glory for this actions in combat. Because you know who's going to get those awards? You're not going to. They're going to give them to your family at Arlington National Cemetery. Awards and glory doesn't move a man or a woman to go do some selfless act that probably will cost them their life on the battlefield. And the part that I don't think a lot of leaders in America understand is the thing that will move a man or a woman to do something like this is love. It's love for your buddies. You see, what I said to Thomas next is, look, man, I need you on those Humvees, but your friends are still out there and they need you. And if we don't roll back out of these city streets, chances are none of them are going to make it back alive. 
And one of the people that I am most proud of, this guy deserves to be in the movie Black Hawk Down. This scene in the movie Black Hawk Down is where Thomas rolls up to me and says, I can't do that, Sergeant. I can't go back out there. And after a very short conversation with him, I look in my rearview mirror as we're getting ready to drive away, and I watch him reach down and pick up his squad automatic weapon, get on the back of the last Humvee, and roll back out into those city streets with me, not once, but multiple times, and spend all night long on those city streets, expecting in any second that he would get killed for going back out there, but willing to do it because he loves those men that are out in those city streets and is willing to exchange his life for theirs. When you start talking about the ethics of courageous leadership, especially on the battlefield, when you start talking about leading men and women to their death, you know, they know, if I go do what you tell me to do, boss, I very well may die for this. You know that, they know that. I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Just tuck this away in your tool belt. It's not glory. It's not patriotism. It's ultimately going to be their love for the, for the mission and their loyalty to the leader that causes them to get on the back of a Humvee or to go charge a machine gun nest or to go take Hamburger Hill or to go assault those beaches on June 6, 1944. That's the thing that's gonna cause men and women to go do the kind of feats of valor that our country has produced men and women to do. Loyalty is the currency that allows a leader to lead with courage on the battlefield. Loyalty is the currency that allows somebody to lead with courage in a boardroom. It's the currency that allows somebody to lead with courage in their own living room or in their kitchen. And the kind of person that has integrity that you trust is the kind of person that's going to develop your loyalty. And when they've got your loyalty, now they can really make some courageous moves. By the way, we're not just talking about physical courage, the willingness to put your life on the line. I'll give you a quick example. This also applies to moral courage as well. And by that, I mean the ability to say what needs to be said when nobody else is willing to say it. There was a very tense conversation in the Oval Office with the President of the United States. And this tense conversation was with the highest level leaders. By the way, I'm not talking about President Trump. I'm talking about 1933, George C. Marshall, I mean, uh, Douglas MacArthur, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In MacArthur's own words, I want you to listen to how this conversation went in 1933 in the Oval Office. This is what MacArthur said. He said, I felt it my duty to take up the cudgels. The country's safety was at stake. And I said so bluntly. The president turned his full vials of his sarcasm upon me. He was a scorcher when aroused and the tension began to boil over. For the third and final time in my life that, listen to what he says next, that paralyzing nausea began to creep over me. In my emotional exhaustion, I spoke recklessly to the President of the United States and said something to the general effect that when we lost the next war, this is 1933, when we lose the next war, and an American boy is lying in the mud with an enemy bayonet through his belly and an enemy foot on his dying throat and spat out the last curse. I wanted his curse to be Franklin Roosevelt, not Douglas MacArthur. The president was livid. He said in front of everybody, you must not talk that way to the president of the United States. And he was right. Of course, and I knew it almost as soon as the words left my mouth. I said I was sorry, and I apologized, but I felt my career was at an end. Listen to what Douglas MacArthur does next. I felt my career was at an end, and I told him, you have my resignation as chief of staff of the Army. If you are unwilling to bend, Mr. President, you have my resignation. 
As I reached for the door, his voice came with me with cool detachment that reflected his extraordinary self-control. He said, Douglas, don't be foolish. You and the budget guys can get together. Basically, the budget was being decimated in the US military and MacArthur said, I will resign before I let this continue. He said, don't be foolish, Douglas. You and the budget guys must get this together. And then Dern, MacArthur's chief of staff, shortly reached to my side and I could hear his gleeful tones. When we were walking out the door, his chief of staff said to him, you have just saved the army. Now listen to what MacArthur says he does next. He's walking out of the doors of the White House. And as soon as he gets to the steps, he vomits because of the emotional um, fear that he had been dealing with in the Oval Office. You see, MacArthur decided, this is it. If this is one of those lose my career moments, then I am going to lose my career before I let the nation decimate the military. And we're not ready, 1933, for the next war. But don't be the person who automatically goes to the end and says, yeah, but look at what MacArthur did. He saved the army and perhaps he saved the nation because he found, he convinced the president to provide the money to resource the military. No, no, pay close attention to what MacArthur said. I had this nausea in my stomach that was so severe that when I walked out of the Oval Office that day, I vomited on the steps of the White House because I was so scared of what I just did. You see, when I talk about leadership courage, it's not just your willingness to stand up and to face the bombs and the bullets on a battlefield. Sometimes the greatest courage is the willingness to stand up and to confront somebody at work or in your neighborhood or in a classroom or in your office who nobody else in the, in the room is willing to stand up and you don't want to do it, but nobody else is willing to and you decide, all right, this is one of those issues where I'm gonna to have to stand up and make a stand. This, in my opinion, is the essence of leadership courage. It comes from within, and then it starts to infiltrate or it starts to resonate to the people around you, and when they see you stand up, they're willing to step up. Because they believe in you, they trust you, you're developing some loyalty to you, they will follow you even to their own death if they know you're going with them. This is the essence of combat leadership. This is the essence of courageous leadership. And it's not just found on the battlefield. Sometimes it's found in the living room. Sometimes it's found in the boardroom. And my challenge to you, all of you, whatever walk of life that you come from, is be the kind of man or woman that the folks that are following you say, I will follow that man, I will follow that woman, even to my death, because I believe in them. You have a man in the back of the room who I would trust and follow Dr. Rob Marsh to my death if he asked it, because I believe in that man and who he is and what he stands for, not just him, but his family's commitment to our country. So I just wanna say to you, thank you so much for your attention tonight. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you. And I think if we have a few moments, I'll, uh, I'll spend those answering some questions for you, but thank you so much for the chance to be with y'all tonight. And God bless you.